Thank you for joining us for the final event of our 2022 Artists in Conversation series, Contemporary Storytelling in Classical Music. Today, I am honored to introduce Samantha Williams, who will be presenting her lecture, Storytelling Across Difference, American Patriots. Samantha Rose Williams is a young professional who's committed to sharing marginalized experiences with diverse audiences and creating space for critical discussion about art, culture, and social change. She earned her BA at Stanford University, her Master of Music at the University of Michigan, and just this weekend graduated with her specialist in music degree in voice performance, also from University of Michigan. Yay, congratulations. <laughs> um, let's see, in addition to her studies, Samantha works as the Media and Marketing Relations Manager at the University Musical Society, as an Associate Director at the University of Michigan, and as the Research Fellow at the Excel Lab. She created and currently writes for Typecast, a blog series devoted to exploring DEI and marginalized representation in the performing arts. She hopes that through sharing nuanced stories of people of all backgrounds and beliefs, she can be a part of breaking down the walls of us and other and help to create a more sympathetic and equitable world. We are so glad to have you with us on your graduation weekend, Samantha. Welcome. <laughs> I am so thrilled to be here. This is the best way to wrap up graduation weekend. So thank you all for making the time to have me and for showing up today. I'm really excited to chat with you guys. Um, so I'm Samantha. I will probably refer to myself as Sam. Feel free to call me either. I will respond to just about anything. Um, I am really excited today to talk to you about uh, my project, American Patriots, and the larger theme of how we can think about storytelling across difference, particularly in classical music. So let's make sure that you all can see my screen. Can everyone, yes, fabulous. Okay, um, let's dive in. So this all started, um, I guess I've always had a love for talking about conversations about representation and casting. And this all began with my Broadway debut. Um, all right, it was my off, 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 off Broadway debut, but the performance was at Broadway by the Bay. So it had Broadway in the title and is not complete false advertising. Um, but back in 2018, I was thrilled to be cast as Eliza Doolittle in My Fair Lady. I got my face on a billboard. I had made it. This was my chance as a sophomore in college to really throw myself in and see if I really had what it takes. Um, you know, cue the Disney, like, you know, montage of the like underdog trying to figure everything out. I had never done any accent work before. I had never had to perform in a corset before. I had to waltz and sing in a corset. I was struggling, working so hard, and we finally made it to opening night. I was so incredibly proud. There were reporters in the audience. Um, this was my moment to see if I had what it took. And so I was you know, super nervous, scrolling online to see what the reviews had to say, and was shocked when the very first review that I saw was titled, A Not So Fair, My Fair Lady. And it had nothing to do with the quality of the show. The reporter was talking about the fact that I was a Black female playing the role of Eliza Doolittle, and that it was really distracting to the story to have a Black female in this role because the story was never meant to tell the story of a Black girl um, breaking through the glass ceiling um, and having this rags to riches story because, you know, at the time that My Fair Lady takes place, that wouldn't have been really feasible for a Black woman to kind of become a socialite in this way. And I was fairly crushed. I scoured this review everywhere looking for like actual discussion on how I was as a performer. And there was a little at the end that wasn't really, you know, it, it, you know, they seemed to think I was fine, but really wanted to spend this whole article talking about what it meant for me to be in this role. And I really struggled with that for a while. Um, I talked a lot to my director who was a young Asian American director at the time, who was absolutely amazing and kind of sat me down and said, Sam, like by being a black performer, you have to understand that anytime you're on stage, it's gonna be a political statement. And I really struggled with that because I wasn't sure that that's what I wanted as a sophomore in college, you know? I was really excited to get to play the ingenue and to fall in love and to sing and dance and look pretty. And I didn't really want it to be a political statement. Um, and so I really had to start grappling with these big questions about representation and casting from a pretty early start in my career as a performer. 
Um, and I've done a lot since then. I've written a blog on this. I've done a lot of research, spent a lot of hours thinking about it, but this is important context as we dive into 2020. So as I'm sure you all remember, 2020 was a mess. Um, just, you know, we had a pandemic, we had George Floyd protests, we had just what felt like in many ways, just the end of America as we kind of knew it. And I found myself in the midst of 2020 really um, spending a lot of time at home and a lot of time in front of the TV and really looking at what was going on in this country. Um, I'm from right outside of DC, so I couldn't help but start going to some of the George Floyd protests that were happening in the Black Lives Matter protests in DC. And I was there on the day that President Trump brought in a bunch of tanks and the National Guard and that lovely moment of standing in front of our nation's capitals and it looking like we were in a war zone, um, peacefully protesting and just being face to face with some of the most intense weapons I've ever seen in my life. Um, and so I had this moment of kind of being at this protest and feeling like I was in the midst of doing what I thought was my patriotic duty and right to stand up for what I thought was an abuse of power and stand up for what I thought America was supposed to be. And then I found myself kind of looking at these police officers and these service members who were standing on the other side, also standing there doing what they felt was their patriotic duty and doing what they thought that was they were meant to do for our country. And I really started to think about how, it, I found that really interesting, right? Um, how is it that so many of us has such different lenses that we're looking at this society through, and yet we all think that we are, or maybe we don't all think, but there are very different, very, very vastly different definitions of patriotism or what's not patriotic or what we should be doing or what we shouldn't. And so I also at this time, because, you know, I didn't have school, I was losing my mind. We'd all watched the same Netflix shows at that time, right? Like we'd already finished Tiger King. There wasn't that much else out there. I started really diving back into books. And at that time, when really all of this was happening, I was happening to be reading Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. And then I read There, There by Tommy Orange. Both of these books are absolutely amazing. And if you haven't read them, you should read them. Um, but they basically talk about um, the white working class experience in America, as well as the indigenous and Native American experience in America. And I really got obsessed with how can I talk about this? How can I think about this? And naturally, as a singer, I was like, OK, cool. I have to find a way to sing about it. Let's write some music, sing about patriotism. Um, and I was really, really compelled to do it from multiple perspectives. I think we live in a time where we are all so easily in our own echo chambers. It's actually incredibly hard to find perspectives vastly different from our own and really engage with them. And so I wanted to do this thing. I wanted to explore what does it mean to be a patriot? I wanted to explore who feels entitled to the American dream. Who is this country for? And how and why has patriotism kind of become aligned with the conservative right? And I wanted to look at these questions from more perspectives than just my own. And I thought it would be really interesting to do them from the white working class perspective and the Native American perspective. Um, and so I was like, okay, cool, let's figure this out. Great, I actually can't write music and um, I'm black, not white working class or Native American. So can I actually do any of that without getting canceled? How do I start to think about this? And so my biggest things that I sat down with were my concerns. And I really kind of sat with those for a while. And so I thought about how can I tell stories other than my own responsibly? How can I portray marginalized identities, not as caricatures? And how can I account for my own biases and limited perspectives, right? Like I really wanted to look at this from these multiple perspectives, but I also had to own the fact that I am a black female, 27 year old liberal human, right? And that's the lens through which I look at the world. Um, but I didn't want the whole performance to be seen through my lens. I wanted it to really kind of be looking at each of these or multiple lenses equally. And so I, this made me think back to a lot of the bigger questions I'd already been grappling with in different areas in the performing arts. Um, anyone who's even remotely in the performing arts is aware of a lot of the controversies that are going on around these questions of how should we deal with portraying gender, sexuality, disability other than our own, right? You don't have to go far to see articles, shows, cancel campaigns dedicated to these issues, right? Um, I just have written blog posts on these different um, shows on these questions and I'm really, really intrigued by a lot of the dialogue that's happening. In general, 
the way these conversations have gone have kind of gone um, transitioned from this approach originally back in the day of colorblind casting to color conscious casting to where we kind of are today, which is authentic casting. Um, and I am talking about casting, but it really is larger and really is just dealing with storytelling practices in general. And we've kind of as a society seem to have settled on this idea that certain types of characters should be played only by people who share those characters essential experiences, right? When we come down to a lot of the controversy that surrounds stories like um, Sia's actually pretty terrible movie music. I don't know if any of you have seen that, you really don't need to, but she tries to tell the story of um, an autistic girl um, and really did, I mean, it, there was a lot of missed opportunities throughout it, but she cast a um, she cast a girl who was not autistic as the main character. There was no one who was autistic in the production team and it, it really fell short of the mark. But if you read and really spend time with a lot of the people who are upset and a lot of the controversy around it, it comes down to the idea that a lot of people believe you cannot have an autistic character portrayed by a non-autistic actor. That at this point in time, there are certain experiences that only people who have those life experiences should be able to portray on screen in performing arts, et cetera. And that really seems to be where a lot of, um, you know, the zeitgeist of our time is landing. Of course, there are people who aren't doing that, um, but this really seems to be particularly where people of our generation and our age are, are sitting. And I have some problems with that. So I, I kind of sat down and spent time with why it was bothering me. Um, and I think it's interesting because we live in, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Forget you saw that, that point. Um, we live in a time where we're living in a society that's becoming increasingly diverse, right? And so questions of how we should deal with representation are only gonna become more important and more present. And the more we live in the society, the more intersections of identities and experiences we're coming across, right? Like people are not just one thing. We are conglomerations of 10 million different experiences. And so I've started to feel like there are just a lot of issues with this current dialogue around authentic storytelling and casting. So for me, I, I wanna make sure I'm clear it is amazing, it is amazing that in 2022, we are finally at a place where we wanna hold artistic teams accountable for the choices they are making. It has been time. We have had so much damage done to marginalized communities and identities throughout this period of time, throughout history. But I just think we need to be thoughtful in the way we're going about it. And so I think that basically what it comes down to is that Authentic casting and authentic storytelling to me is essentialist and reductive, right? We see these campaigns for all BIPOC characters to be played by an actor of the aligning race, campaigns for all disabled characters to be portrayed by disabled actors, trans characters by trans actors. But all of this talk about authenticity is effectively boiling us down into one marginalized identity and saying that that is the most important factor about us, right? It assumes that race, disability, or gender is the most defining characteristic of one's identity when that's not universally true. Intersectionality theory, identity salience theory, my own personal experiences as a Black woman show me that those are just meant, you know, important elements, but one of many elements that define who I am. And it's hard for me because I am a 27 year old Black woman. And if we really live by this authentic storytelling mindset, that means I can only be a part of creating stories that talk about the experiences of. Black 27 year old women, right? Like how far are we taking this? Where are we defining it? And where are we allowing for art to be art, which is about storytelling and creating and imagining, of course, respectfully and responsibly, but it's kind of important to it. Secondly, this concept of authentic storytelling is a really ambiguously defined ideal. As I said, I've kind of defined it as certain types of characters should be played only by actors who share those characters' essential experiences. And again, I think this is a really noble idea, but I think that the intent has been warped with this crusade for authentic casting. For instance, um, I have seen campaigns about disability. I've seen campaigns about race. I've seen campaigns about ethnicity. I've seen campaigns about gender and sexuality, but I've actually never seen campaigns about any of these identities that are not visible. So if we think about other identities that are super um, important to, you know, the essential experiences of an individual, mental illness, age, 
all of these things very clearly have the cap the ability to to say that an experience is you know only can only really be spoken about by someone who also has that lived experience. But there aren't campaigns for those things, and I think it's because we're not really talking about authentic storytelling. We're kind of conflating multiple issues in this current dialogue we're having. Um, and I think. Sorry, give me one second to catch up on my notes. I'm talking faster than I planned. And I think part of what's so interesting to me in this is that what it comes to me is that we're conflating issues of representation with access and opportunity. So yes, it is very important for us to have trans actors represented in the world of the performing arts. Yes, it is important to have more diverse stories and to have stories that are talking about all different people of all different identities and experiences. But that doesn't mean that the only person who is ever able to tell a certain story has to be able to be defined as specifically as that story and that identity. And you can see kind of this, you know, the confusion of all of this, particularly just with how ambiguous this idea is when it comes to examples like the Big Mouth controversy, which happened maybe a year ago, where there's a character in Big Mouth named Missy, who is, one parent is Jewish and one parent is Black. She's a biracial uh, Jewish character. And the original actress was Jewish. And there was a controversy around her voice acting this character who presents to the visual eye as Black. And so they, she left her spot and they picked a Black actress to take over. Both actresses were ridiculously talented and are great and perfectly capable of doing this role. But the current actress is Black and not Jewish. So who's really to say which actress had more, you know, um, claim to portraying this role? And are we really saying that the solution would be to find a Black Jewish voice actress to do that role? Like, is that how far we're taking it? How far exactly do we want to bring this? And so I guess it all to me is antithetical to the entire point of storytelling, which is about creation, which is about portrayal, which is about respect, but is about being able to disappear into something different than yourself. That's why I got into performance. That's why I got into acting. If I just wanted to portray a 27 year old black woman, I don't, I don't have to go on stage to do that, right? And so I think it's important for us to think about the ways in which we can find a more nuanced way of thinking about storytelling and how we want to deal with that. So I've kind of been coming up with this concept um, that I like to call intentional storytelling. And I think that that's something that can help us with storytelling across difference. Um, the quick overview of it, and I promise I will then backtrack and go more into detail, is that the four most important things are one, to have a diverse production team. Two, to engage in collaborative processes with the marginalized communities in question. Three, to have intentional, transparent, and accessible explanations for any controversial representation choices. And four, to present marginalized communities with intentionality and respect. So this was something I'd been working on um, in blog posts and kind of talking about in the theoretical world of what we as an industry should be thinking about for casting. But then when I had this idea in 2020 of how do I tell the story, I was like, okay, great. This is the perfect opportunity to see if I am full of shit or if this actually works in the real world. So I sat down and said, what is it that I wanna do here? I wanna tell this story of three different groups and I wanna be able to show the nuance and the individuality they're in. And I am not trying to push a moral on anybody's throat. I don't know if at the end of the day, I'm gonna walk away saying, oh my gosh, we're all still much more similar than we thought, or if I'm going to walk away saying, yeah, no, there is a reason that like, <laughs> we are all in our own echo chambers, we have conflicting interests, we maybe don't all need to really want to be in the same country with each other, like, I don't know, and I'm not going to try to go into this pushing my lens on it. So I was really thinking about how I could take this um, idea of how to do intentional storytelling and create a process by which I could follow that would give me a product that I was able to like feel proud of and feel like was responsible and respectful of all of the groups I was interested in collaborating with. So I started out with the concept of having a diverse production team. So again, intentionality has to start from the beginning and you have to make space for new blood and provide mentorship. So from the beginning, I thought, um, who is my production team in some ways, right? Like who are, who are the people who have claim to this project? And I was really particularly thinking a lot about a lot of conversations and really great points I've seen about basically 
you know, we don't need any other person speaking for us. We all have our own voices and are ready to share them. Just ask us. And so I thought, okay, how can I incorporate this? And I got the idea of kind of taking a verbatim theater approach that I'd seen in a lot of things like Anna DeVere Smith's work, or if you've seen certain musicals like um, Come From Away um, and musicals that basically take verbatim written testimonies from people and use that as the text for their, their show. And so I said, okay, I want to interview people. I want to ask average Americans these questions and transcribe their responses. So I set out to interview 50 Americans who identified as white working class, Native American, and African American. Um, I ended up interviewing about 35, um, but I had an even split um, of a third of each group. I was able to pay each interviewee $30 for 30 minutes of their time and to use the amazing stuff that is Zoom transcription so that I didn't have to spend as much time retranscribing everything they said because 30 minutes of an interview is a lot of text. Um, and basically the way I went about it was asking them the same series of questions, but also really baking into the project the idea that I wanted everyone to feel like they had ownership over the way their story was being told. So I, one, you know, promised myself I wasn't going to do any real editing of the text. I was going to spend as much as I, as much as I absolutely could, I was going to keep to exactly what they'd said. I would maybe let some of my composers cut a few ums and errs and things like that, or if it was repetitive, but I was really going to make sure I was keeping the essence of what they said. Two, the way I was able to really make sure I was incorporating them into the production team was once I had picked the segments from an interview and picked them for songs, I went back to each person I'd interviewed and got them to sign off on the way I was using their text. They got a copy of what they originally said and how we were using it in the song, and they had to sign off on allowing us to use it for the performance. They also had, of course, the opportunity to say if they wanted their name attached, how much um, visibility they basically wanted or not. Additionally, um, I walked into this really focusing on how I could engage in collaborative processes. I ask a lot of other groups to show me their work cited page. It blows my mind, particularly in classical music, how we are so, like we would never imagine someone putting on a French opera without having taken classes in French diction, French literature, all of the stylistic things that go into French opera. But then when we're dealing with cultural things that are more like close to home, we somehow think we can just wing it or, you know, like I know a person or I've read a book and that's enough. So I can just kind of go from my gut. Um, and that is the absolute opposite of how I think we should be dealing with this, particularly when dealing with marginalized communities who have such higher stakes in the way their stories are being told. So in order to do that, again, I was really clear with my interviews and talking with them about how much transparency they wanted from their overall um, transcript, how much they were okay with me sharing about the context of where the part of that interview came from, if they were okay with me sharing more, things like that, and making sure that the interviews and the text was really front and forward around my project. And two, it was in partnerships. So I decided that another way to kind of help with my own personal biases, right? And the fact that I can only truly speak from my own experience was to partner with collaborators from each of these identities who could be basically the in-between from text to the setting of music, right? Because the way we set text also puts so much, that shapes the way we're able to engage with it, that we're able to either um, dismiss something or enhance it or give it legitimacy just from the ways that we set it. So I was able to partner with the absolutely amazing collaborators, Danielle, Regina, Bran, and Gala, who were each huge parts of this project who worked with me. Um, each composer actually kind of wanted to deal with the texts in different ways um, and wanted to engage with the texts of the other identities in different ways. So that was an interesting thing to kind of play around with. And something also that I really wanted through this was really seeking critical feedback, right? Using my composers as equal collaborators and making sure I was gathering feedback and not just gathering feedback. I think something that sometimes we can do as creatives is we set things, we say things in a way where we're not actually asking for feedback, right? Or we're not really creating a space for feedback that's not agreeing with what we're already trying to do. And so something I did really try to do throughout the process was making sure I let my collaborators know that like, this is a really a two-way relationship and that this performance we're working towards in, which just passed uh, two weeks ago, April 10th, is the workshop. 
that I am hoping to bring this further and that I want feedback about what we hate, what works, what doesn't, and if there are parts of this that don't work for you. So this is my concept. This is the way I've been thinking about it, but how do you want things to be different? Um, and so something, so there were lots of cool moments that happened with that. Um, there were a lot of adjustments that Bran and I made to the way we were kind of handling the texts in those sets. Um, a really great moment for me working with Danielle was Danielle talking to me about the importance of getting um, perspectives from elders um, and really trying to make that something that was a focus in the people I was continuing to seek out for interviews. Um, and that was just a really important part. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad I got to do that. Um, number three was about having intentional, transparent, and accessible explanations for any controversial representation choices. Um, so as I've said, I am not someone who believes that you can only perform something if you are that exact identity, or you can only be a part of storytelling for something if you're that exact identity. However, there are certain things that are going to be controversial, and if that is true, you need to show that you have thought about it, you have done your research, you have talked to people, that you didn't just realize it when somebody brings up the complaint. Um, so for the April 10th recital, I was the person who did all of the performance of American Patriots, right? I sang all of the songs, me, myself, as a Black female body. Um, that is not the way I hope it will be in future performances. I really am excited about the idea of bringing in more voices from different perspectives as performers. I would love to have a Native performer, a um, white working class performer, in addition to myself, but I also think it would be really powerful to not have each person singing the songs of their own identity, because I do think it is really important to play with this sitting in the shoes and the literal skin of people different than yourself and finding the similarities and the way to connect to that. So um, this was something I talked about a lot in my recital, in the program notes, and before I started singing, just to explain to the audience, chat with them about it, and I had a Q&A at the end where I was allowing people to kind of give feedback and ask questions. There were definitely a few texts in the final performance that were more controversial than others. Um, all of them, again, were approved by the people who were using them, and I really wanted to make sure that people weren't being represented as caricatures. Um, I will probably chat a few more about details in that in the Q&A, but that was another important thing that I made sure to integrate in American Patriots. Um, four is about presenting marginalized communities with respect rather than as caricatures. Um, so clearly, um, just going over the importance of this, as we've learned, at least as I've learned from living in, you know, Trump's America, if you repeat a lie enough, fiction can begin to displace truth, right? And so it is important the way we are representing stories and telling people's stories, because if we are continuing to say the same problematic caricatures, that does have real effects on the people who we are portraying. And these stakes are higher for marginalized communities who often don't have the ability or the platform to reshape and retake the narrative themselves. In doing this, you also any type of work like this, you have to have a lot of space for nuance. You have to understand that the intent is incredibly different, can be incredibly different than your impact. And you, of course, do your best to make sure you're being thoughtful about both. But you also have to be open to real and honest feedback if that is not the case. And you have to be ready to be vulnerable and humble and to accept the fact that, like, I did all of this work. And sure, I think it's all right to share what the work you did to show the intent. But then you also have to own the impact and make adjustments and go from there. Um, also, I think that it's really important to like, just notice the difference between casting and programming and how that can kind of um, impact this as well. For American Patriots, of course, this was something where I had complete control over the casting and the programming. But often when we're doing these types of stories, particularly in opera or musical theater, we may only have control over the casting, right? We're doing a work that already exists and there might be things that are baked into that story that we have to think about with more nuance again in terms of intent and impact. Um, and so the final product, um, on April 10th, I was able to present American Patriots, which had 50 minutes of music exploring American patriotism from three seemingly disparate American perspectives. Um, I conducted 35 interviews and was able to pay everyone for their time. Um, 16 songs were derived from 14 interviews. Two songs were set to the text of the New Colossus, which is the poem at the Statue of Liberty. I was really interested in looking at kind of this idea of what America claims it is and who we claim we are for, which is kind of what the text of the New Colossus is about, versus a lot of the things that have become 
mainstream in social media and in the news that we hear today. So I took one of the settings of the new Colossus and I interspersed it with tweets from President Trump and things that were said kind of during that, um, that election campaign um, that were kind of qualifying the type of people we want to come to America and who we actually think that this country is for and kind of held those two songs in, um, in yeah, in kind of uh, juxtaposition with each other. Um, I got to work with six amazing collaborators and there is a visual album that we'll be releasing this summer um, as I think it's really important, particularly with classical music. And when you're doing work that doesn't necessarily represent the stereotypical community that sees classical music to think about um, ways that you can reach those communities that aren't asking them to come to a recital hall where they may not necessarily feel is they're the most welcome or may not be something that they're used to going to. So um, I'm working with a director, a videographer, and um, my amazing collaborators to basically turn elements of American Patriots into something kind of like Beyonce's Lemonade, but less cool because no one's as cool as Beyonce, but that idea of a visual album that basically allows it to be shared freely online. Um, and hopefully, um, you know, seeing how things go this summer, I will be able to tour American Patriots um, next year. So I wanted to make sure we had time for the questions and people's thoughts. I know I went through a lot of material and I talked very quickly. So I am really excited to hear what you all said and clarify anything that I didn't say as clearly as I meant to the first time. Um, thanks so much for listening. Yay. Put on mute and cheer for her. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sam. That was Yay. fabulous. <laughs> Hi everyone! Hi Danielle! Oh <laughs> Justin's giving his thumbs up from over there. Yeah. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Yeah, I mean, just like Sam said, it's question time. Anybody have thoughts, feelings, questions they want to ask? Well, I was going to ask, can, is, can we watch it or record it? But you're saying it'll be on sale this summer? It will be free this summer. Um, it will hopefully be ticketed in the fall, like for live performances. I have a, 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 it's not bootleg. I have a not as high quality as I would like recording of the live performance that my father did. He did a great job for my dad, um, but the audio isn't quite where I'd love it to be. And there's some shaky cam moments, um, but that's like lurking around. Danielle may or may not have a copy. So you of course can find that if you'd like it. Um, and then the visual album will be released at like end of July to August, but it probably won't have every song in it. So, it, you know, a teaser. Cool. We will make sure we post that on our social media when that comes out for everybody on the call. Yeah, I'm excited to see that. I would love to hear, I mean, as a performer, I would love to hear what it was like to know, to, have, to be part of that whole experience of like curating and finding the text, working with a composer to make that piece happen. And then in performance, like, did it feel different to you than singing a German Schubert art song? Like what, I would just love to hear that, what you had. Yeah, um, uh, as a performer, it felt like, uh, I don't know, I guess it, a lot of it was terrifying. I think it was scary to try to think, uh, it was exciting when it was just an idea. And then from then on, it was kind of scary that, I, not that it was on me, but that it might not, that the, the, success of that final project, it was hard to balance the amount of time I wanted to give it as an artist with all the amount of effort I needed to give it as a production producer person. Um, and so, you know, I would like try to block out different hours of the day as like American Patriots administration time. This is for emailing and form, you know, cause like tracking down 35 people and getting their signatures and getting them to respond takes a lot of emailing. And then also trying to learn the music because you know you get it from different times at different composers and all of that great stuff. Um, so that, I guess it felt scary as a performer up until <laughs> the recital maybe. Um, at the same time, it was the most fun I've had in the practice room in like three years um, because I genuinely cared about the music and I just realized I'd spent so much time in classical music doing what I had to do or doing what I was asked to do or doing what I was supposed to do. And I didn't really relate to or care about the stuff. And it felt like I was putting in a lot of energy to, to try to make it relate to my life. Um, and that often made me really bitter, particularly when I felt like our society was like falling apart in front of us. And I was singing songs about flowers and unrequited love. Like I was just like, I don't 
have time to, to be doing that and going to protests at night. Like it just, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like a good use of my time. Um, so I think that was that in terms of what it actually felt like singing it, it felt really freeing because, because it was something that was a new creation and because it was something that was really something that was collaborated on between me and the composers I worked with, I felt free to play around with style and break certain rules that, you know, nobody could tell me I was singing it wrong. Well, the composers could, but they were very sweet. But outside of them, no one could tell me I was singing it wrong. You know, like if my teacher said she didn't like something or I shouldn't use straight tone, I could say, well, actually, this is the reason I'm using that. And like at, in the interview, this is the way the person inflected that. And so that's important to me. Um, and so I think it, I had a lot more agency in the making sure that everyone was represented fairly because I really, all of the people we picked for interviews I felt a really strong connection with what they were trying to say and felt really compelled to make sure I was giving them the best chance of being heard. Um, so that was a cool part of the experience for sure. I just want to chime in and say, well, awesome to see you again, Sam. And um, obviously we've talked a lot about this project, but I just want to say it's like amazing and it's great to hear to like hear the spiel now that it's like, you know, <laughs> like <fun. laughs> it's at the beginning, right? And then, and now it's like, oh, okay, now we have it here. And um, and I, I think one of the most beautiful things is that it is like, you're, I really admire you in that. So I'm sure as performers, we're all feeling the same thing in that now things are busy, right? Like the world is quite, is more open and we have all this stuff going on. And, and I feel like so many people had these passion projects that started in COVID. And then we just kind of like let them fall by the wayside because, oh God, we need to sing Schubert. Like, you know, we're like, Wagner must be in the opera hall, you know? And, and I just, yeah, I really admire that th this is still like an ongoing thing. And, um, and as a composer and also as an audience member, like um, I, when I watched the performance, it was just so like, just fed my soul so much. And I mean, it was just amazing. I don't know. I did have a question at the end of this, but I forgot. But basically, yeah, like kudos. Love it, love it, love it. And I'll probably think of my question in like five minutes. So Absolutely. <laughs> I have like a random thing I want to share that I realized I probably should have just made a slide for, which was just one of the like, um, I think moments that I grew the most in this project and I'm most thankful for now um, were the moments in the interviews where I felt like I, um, didn't like get, I'm so dramatic that I'm a singer. I like everything I think of, I'm like, that's, yeah, that's so dramatic. I'm like, I got my ass handed to me. It wasn't that dramatic, but the moments where I felt like I was out of my depth in interviews. So again, so I was really excited to do this. And again, I was really, really, really aware of the fact that I had one identity that was mine. And so I was like, okay, like, what is my, you know, even in interviewing people, how am I being thoughtful about the way I'm going about this? Am I, you know, like I, you know, I'm always, you know, I, I read all the books I could find. I read, you know, I read not all the books. I read some books. And then I was like, okay, let's, let's, you know, try some stuff, start with friends, start with connections, see where things go. And I had experiences in probably at least one interview with like each identity where I felt like I, like, I was like, oh crap, like I did it wrong. I will like never forget. There was, um, so like, and Danielle, I'm sure you could like notice from the anxiety when I first had one of my meetings with you as like, I felt particularly like in college, my group of friends, I had a fair number of friends who like identified as white working class, feel very comfortable in black settings. I had a few friends who were Native American and I didn't really feel like most of our conversations went into deep depth about their identity and these, like we talked about it, but it wasn't something I felt versed and like comfy in. And so I was really, really terrified of saying the wrong thing, of offending someone, of like not fully grasping. And I felt like I really had to walk my walk of believing that like, you know, if you have good intent, if you are trying, if you are like there to, and you're ready to be humble and vulnerable and admit what you don't know, and you're not going to try to double down or, you know, that like, it is okay to learn this way, right? Like, I feel like this is another thing in our society right now where often there's this feeling that like, you can't engage until you are perfectly ready to engage, right? If you say the wrong thing, that means you are racist and sexist and ignorant and you didn't care and you didn't, you know, and all that stuff. And I, vehemently disagree with that. And I know that like the relationships that I value the most are ones in which we feel comfortable actually asking each other questions and learning. And like, there's this, um, you know, it's a built um, respect and like, you know, belief in best intent, but where that exists. And so anyway, I had a few interviews where I 
you know, I, I remember I had this one interview um, and we set this song, um, Danielle, where I was talking to this woman and I was, we were talking about all sorts of stuff. The interview was going great. Um, she was Native American and we were talking and at some point we got onto education and like things that were going on in the US with like a lot of the like kind of culture wars. And I was like, yeah, so like, what do you think about that? Like, what do you think about these conversations that are going on about like, you know, how we tell American history? And she just like, kind of like, was just like, are there conversations going on about that? And I was like, oh, let me tell you about it. You know, like, you don't know, like, dude, it's like all over the news right now. And, you know, she had said previously, she didn't really watch TV and all this stuff. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like she's, let me, let me explain to her like critical race theory. It's all this stuff. And like, she just let me talk for, I don't know, 45 seconds. I was given the spiel and then she just politely interrupted me and was just like, no, no, no. I, I know about that. I'm actually aware of critical race theory. What I was saying was that that isn't actually talking about American history. But critical race theory is only talking about basically the black experience. But if you really wanna talk about American history, we need to take it further back. And you need to understand that if we're looking at it from this perspective, we need to be looking at it from all colors, right? And I just had this moment of like, that is a thousand percent right. Like I completely misread the situation. You know, it wasn't, she wasn't upset with me, but it was just this moment of like me coming in with my like, yeah, yeah, let me and just having to take a moment. And in that call, you know, we were talking about all this stuff. And so I started asking her more questions about it. And I was like, you're right. Like, I, I don't know enough about that. Tell me. She recommended an indigenous people's history of the United States. I went and bought the book. It was the most uncomfortable read of my life. Um, and one of the most powerful. And like, I took a bunch of quotes from that and integrated those into American Patriots because I found all these things where I was like, it is wild that that is not more common knowledge, right? And like conversations that I had with my friends and family from that. And I felt like it deepened my, my own personal growth. And then of course, the way that I was able to like bring that into the project and things like that. Um, so anyway, there were just lots of moments like that. And I think that that was something that was really emotional is too much, but it, it was something I was very anxious about, right? Like I had, I'd done my Wikipedia work. I'd done my, whatever. I talked to my two closest friends. I'd done everything I could, but at a certain point, you just have to acknowledge that like, there might be some differences between intent and impact in the work you're doing and, you know, go out there and yeah, I guess just be humble. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think like from the composer's perspective, like, um, I, I think we were perhaps the other composers as well, because I love the project because you're trying to focus on like that individual person who like, just like you were saying, we all belong into this like conglomerate of different subsets. And so like me as like a half native, right? Like, like I've, I've written music about being like a half blood, you know, like a half breed. And I, and I know this experience, but I knew I was studying, I was, I, I didn't know the interviewers as I was studying them. Um, for everybody's information. And so I didn't know if um, these people were also mixed race or also yeah. were probably from like completely different tribes. Like the like Choctaw experience is completely different than the Ojibwe experience is right. completely different than the Inuit experience. And so, um, but having that framework of that, we're here to experience this together and to acknowledge the individuality of each of these people through, through like acknowledging it, right? Like through stating like we are all individuals and it allows so much more freedom artistically and also just like through as a, as the uh, viewer as well while watching because I I chose not to um, see the other composer's music before because let's say I just didn't want to like compare myself because she has some like top, top, top <laughs> composers going on there. So I was like, maybe me. But, um, but just listening to their um, their music and not feeling as if how I felt I think is that we were a community of people of all individuals of people with all individual experiences rather than me as a mixed race mixed race native woman watching um, a show about the African American experience or watching a show about this so it really felt like this truly communal space that was open to to everybody's individual identities and um, yeah, it, it was just very, very amazing. And also just to like talk about the other composers too, like you guys should definitely listen to the video when you get a chance because some are absolutely hilarious. Like the word balls is involved and we're talking like those balls. <laughs> and and it, it's just, yeah, so, so, so wonderful. Um, but I also would like to ask like Abby and Maddie, um, 
have you ever had experiences like as white women um, singing music um, that was written by people of color or of different identities or how, how do you engage in kind of this concept as, as white people? Yeah, I mean, I have, um, I might literally be like right over here, but um, the a book that was going around that like art songs written by African-American composers, American, you know, art songs. I have that book and I love singing, you know, exploring in it. And then every time I sing it, I'm like, am I allowed to sing this? I don't think I should be allowed to, right? Like in the presentation of that, am I, what you were saying, Samantha, about like making space for diverse understandings and, and you know, having a diverse production team. If it's just me and my white pianist playing an art song, like I, you know, I get to that point where I'm like, am I brave enough and humble enough and educated enough in these culture, you know, in this different culture to like, or in this facet of a shared culture, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. That's, so that's something that, that came to mind when you asked that question, Danielle, of like, I am just very aware of it. And I find myself being nervous to engage in an open public way. I love playing through them um, by myself at my piano. They're beautiful. I love singing them. They feel great to sing. And then I think about presenting them as a white woman. And I start to be like, maybe I'm not, maybe I shouldn't. Um, I, I sort of agree with that, but I will say singing spirituals at church is something that like, somehow feels not like like I don't know it's an experience I've had okay I'll say that like in, in some of the Porgy and Bess um like I've sung Summertime and and I've sung I mean in some ways like I was joking about this earlier I'm singing a Ukrainian piece tomorrow and I stand right behind a woman who is Ukrainian and I'm just I'm singing Ukrainian in front of her and I'm just thinking Am I butchering her experience language? Anyway, not that that's the same, but um, I guess, yeah, I've, I feel sometimes some guilt, but like, I do think it's beautiful to explore music of all cultures, of all, you know, I mean, I think it's great that you played My Fair Lady. Like, I'm sorry that you had that experience, obviously, Sam, but like, I love, like, I love the idea of just more people of color taking on these iconic roles of and just making them their own because every talent deserves to play every role in some ways, right? But um, yeah, so I guess I, I feel similarly. Like there's a little bit of like, oh, I feel like I need a permission slip somewhere, but also at the same time, I always try to just honor it as best I can by being musical and and feeling sincere and never like mocking as, as one of the, thi or, you know, one of the points Saman Samantha brought up. So thank you for asking. I'm uh, sorry, I didn't mean to like put y'all on the spot, I guess, but I figured no, like, no, I'm, no. I'm just so curious. I guess, so. It's a good thing to think about, especially in the context of choir, because I think I come into that you know, so much of Western music is the white Western experience. So like when you're not seeking it out, you can basically never encounter it, uh, any music from other traditions as a classical artist, right? Um, which is a shame and should not be the way it is, right? Which is where making space for different identities and for new things and new ideas is, is super important. But the place that I interact with music from different cultures the most is in choir. And then when you're in a choir, you're in this place, like our last artist in conversation uh, series last year, we had a speaker come and talk about DEI in choral music, especially for young people and for professional choral singers, right? Like how do you as a white choir member, if your director is not well-educated and does not do the work, but then programs it anyway, and you're just sitting there in the soprano section, what do you do, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, that is, that is definitely a cringe moment and then also like I feel a sense of responsibility as a performer to like educate that person but they're also the person hiring me to do the event and so then there's just all of this weird politics around trying to call people in and have a conversation and 
educate and not even really educate, but just invite them to think about it, and right? Because I'm not the one necessarily to be educating. I'm the one to maybe suggest places to find that education. Um, yeah, it's a lot of thoughts. I would love to hear any thoughts or reactions from what I or Abby just said from, <laughs> from y'all, because I, I mean, for honestly, this is like a learning experience for me of like, well, how, how do you respond to, to what I've just said, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I feel like I've had many conversations on like all of the things you're talking about. Um, the book you were talking about, the African-American art song book was actually published by my voice teacher at Michigan, Dr. Louise Toppin. She's like a wild human who publishes like seven books a year and her goal in life is to get African-American classical repertoire out there so like she is pushing that stuff like it's her job well I guess it is her job so that she's doing a good job um but I have had many conversations she teaches a class about what does it mean to have white singers singing spirituals are there certain spirituals they shouldn't sing right can they sing spirituals but can they just not sing the ones that talk about lynching or something like that right like if the song says black like me how do we feel about that like these types of questions um and I think that this desire to have a permission slip is like valid, right? Like you want some particularly right now, right? Because cancel culture is scary. And like, it doesn't always seem to be the most like, um, it's not always interested in how much you tried or what your thoughts were. <laughs> it's like interested in making something that is sensational and is punishing. And I think that particularly as artists, that can feel really terrifying because we want to do good things and arts usually I think good art takes risks, right? And like, as our world gets, again, more and more diverse, risks inevitably are going to touch on things that have to do with identities that people feel strongly about. And so I think it is scary. I think that part of why, and what I found in this project and what I was like theorizing about was again about the collaboration. So like, if it is not just you making the call, it makes it a lot easier. If you have literally forced yourself to have conversations with other people, and again, not one person because everyone can find a Ben Carson, right? Like you can always find one person of identity who's just gonna say something like off the cuff that nobody else, you know what I Like it's true. And so making sure that you're really challenging yourself to like, and it's not just like collaborate, but like to learn, right? And I think that was something that like, and it's uncomfortable to like be in a space and say like publicly, like, I don't know. And like, if you're in a situation where it's a conductor and you don't know, and they don't know, it is weird, but it is also a space to say, Hey, I also don't know, but I think it would be really great if we all looked into this together. Like, I think this is important. And this is why I think it's important. And I don't really know what the full answer is. Maybe we could just like, you know, send an email to get the ball started. But like, I actually feel like it's really important that we do this. And I don't feel comfortable unless we've had some bigger conversations as a group. And so like those types of things where it's not about having the answer, but it's about asking the right questions and trying to think about it in the more like collaborative way, I think is like where I hope we get. Um, and again, and the thing is that I think is was kind of is scary in this work too, is like, again, you can do all of that and there still can be an impact where someone is really, really hurt by what you're doing. And you have to like also walk with that um, and not to mitigate that, but also like, in art, no one is ever a thousand, you know, like it, it, there's a balance, right? There's a line of like how much intent and how much work you put into something. I'm not doing a good job articulating this at all, but like there, there, like if you, in my mind, like if you have done a certain amount of things and you can show and explain how you got to where you were and someone is saying, I acknowledge that, but this is how that made me feel. If you can able, if you're able to show enough of this and show that there was like, you know, genuine good intent, genuine, like you doing your best, people are way more willing to work with you and like give you latitude and say like, okay, so I personally, it's not for me. I don't like it. That doesn't represent my experience, but I have the space to say like, you've actually thought about this. You're not just coming in and doing something exploitative and dumb. You're not just trying to do this thing. I can have space for you to do that over here. And maybe I don't want to go see your show, but I acknowledge that that's there. And like, I just, no, in my experience, I am way more open to having conversations with people who write stuff about the Black experience that I don't agree with if we can have a conversation that shows that they thought about it and put time and energy into it. And then I'm like, all right, there are Black people who think all sorts of things. You don't have to think about it the same way I think about it. Um, so that was a monologue that maybe was rambly, but that's what I think. <laughs> the way you were explaining that, just, and I would love to hear from Danielle, but I just had a thought, which is the way that you were explaining that made me think of like, you know, in high school math, when you would have like a big math problem and if you showed your work and you got it mostly right but you messed up the very final part and you start, you know like you get points for the work but you still got it wrong yeah 
love that. <laughs> Danielle, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I think we, there, like marginalized voices have so long, have for so long been just completely ignored or like actively pushed down um, that I definitely understand that people are, yeah, they're afraid. They, well, I, I maybe some people are afraid of getting canceled. I definitely know some people of like older generations that are like, oh, I would do this, but I'm getting canceled. But, <laughs> but or I think from more the younger generation, it is from a place, uh, like a good place, you know, yeah. and, and they are, you know, just like you were talking about with the authentic, um, representation versus the, uh, is that what you called it versus the, um, intentional or yeah. intentional. Yeah. And I think that, that, uh, leap is probably particularly difficult for white people and then like I find sorry I'm going off on a different tangent right now but then like I'm what I'm feeling right now is, is that like okay well how do we get how like how do I as like a person of color who can be white presenting but who's from a very like different background of all this stuff like how can I still represent like my identity and not center a white identity while like trying to work to, to help my community like push into this intentional uh, intentional place rather than like quote unquote authentic place mm -hmm. right and um I honestly forgot the question of what we were talking about before <laughs> um, great <laughs> oh about the um, the math problem the math problem thing okay yeah I think the math problem is great like that's totally a thing but I but yeah that's why I was talking about white people okay yeah and then and so I think the math problem reality, I guess, I can understand um, why it's hard for white people. Uh, but white people are the like very large population, like the majority population in classical music. So we, we kind of get to this this stopping point, right? Of, of like, um, yeah, are you gonna, how are we gonna kind of get through that? And I guess it's just bravery, like you talked about before, like you have to be brave and it's gonna be, uncomfortable um but yeah you shouldn't if you don't like keep trying to solve that problem like you're it's never going to be right kind of thing so um right yeah and that very specific example you gave before sam about like if the text of an art song says black like me like do we change you know do i want to still present that art that art song or aria or whatever and somehow change the text so that that artist that composer's work is out there and like obviously then the librettist's work is changed it's just the, the, that's the work you have to do is like as you're programming yeah just make, taking the time and really digging and asking the questions and collaborating and yeah yeah because I don't think there's one right answer for everyone in every situation right and so I think it's like a when you've made a decision you should have your answer at the tip of your tongue ready to talk about and probably it should be in your program note if not mentioned right but like it I'm not I don't know what the answer is for every person but I do think that you should have an answer that you feel good and comfortable about before doing it <laughs> right like know the questions that people are going to ask and have your answer yeah. ready. <laughs> yeah and I think also maybe to be to have an easily accessible way for people to ask you questions that's something like as an indigenous person I've always been mad about like I have a very good friend who is like very involved in DEI and an amazing conductor an amazing musician and her heart's in the right place all like all the time and really educated and all this stuff but they did a um concert on climate on climate action and so and of course they wanted to involve indigenous voices but they the headline piece was not written by an indigenous person it was written by an Asian man and I felt a little bit like they were like, oh, well, it's not a white man, so it's okay. And and in his program, no, I even, I looked at the program notes too, and like to look like, okay, is he, was he going to talk about how he, he came to this and his relationship to this, these people? But literally it was one of these pieces that's like, so in the indigenous culture, this and this and this, and I wrote a piece about it, like, you know, this kind of thing. And, um, but I didn't feel like, there was a place for me to like provide feedback in a, like a safe way right because I wasn't I don't want to ruin my relationship with this conductor I'm new in New York you know everybody has these things but I think that it would be great if there was some sort of like standard of like literally just like a comment box 
that an anonymous comment box sucking, which I mean has its own like <laughs> has its own benefits and and not benefits, obviously, but but definitely like as an indigenous person, especially like with white people, like I'm like whatever, I'll I'll just like tell you. But with other people of color, um, that's where I think the indigenous experience becomes like very hard because mm -hmm. you are like it's a community that has been underrepresented in in all diversity work and you don't want to negate the work that they've been doing and like the place they're at and and so it's like yeah I would just love a place that like or for it to be a little bit more normalized to hear that kind of feedback like within communities of color or like within activist communities and yeah, I, I was gonna wrap it up in a bow, but here I am, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just feel, I feel like, you know, like a good rule of thumb is like, have the conversation, like if you want to perform a piece by, you know, an indigenous person or something, like the rule is talk to at least five indigenous other people about the conversation and like feel like, okay, I've gotten some perspective from a quorum and now I can form my own opinion and inform my statement. I'm going to have my statement. And then like, you know, that's, that's like there's steps, right? Like again, the math problem, if we do these steps, then it's okay, I guess. But, um, I think at the same time you could do all those steps and that still wouldn't be somebody Well, that's else. part of what's hard. About it. <laughs> like there's not, and like, that's right. the thing, right? If you talk like, you can read two books and not read the right books. You can right. talk to 10 people and not get a certain opinion explained to you. You can. And so that's part of the, like, yes, do the research. And also you have to be open to the like uncomfortable fact that like you still might, you know, and then it's, and that's part of the thing of walking it, I guess. I think Danielle, what you said is so true. And the thing that I like, I'm always trying and what I'm still trying to figure out with American Patriots. So we can talk about this offline mm -hmm. is the best ways to, actively get that feedback from people you don't already have good really don't have that trusted relationship with right because like I think in ideal worlds every time you're presenting a work like this you are getting new feedback and learning and getting new information that you can then make adjustments from or at least you know educate yourself by but if people don't know you and trust you you're already in an uphill battle to even get them to share their feedback and then you want them to be able to do it in a way where they feel good and safe and et cetera. But you also potentially want to be able to engage with them further if you need follow-up or you have questions or things. And so like, then you get into these questions of like how to do it in a way that's actually engaging, actually getting the critical feedback you want because like Google Forms aren't it. And like, I mean, sometimes it's it, but like that's only if someone's really actively trying to speak to you. Um, and so how do you find other ways of like, and I think some of that goes into like, the way you engage community and who you have in your audience and where you're right like some of that i think is like actively making efforts to perform in certain places for certain people and those types of things um but i'm i think that's a huge point and i think you're absolutely right and i think we have to find more ways to do that and ingrain that in classical music yeah and i feel like i was just gonna i was thinking about what danielle said about a comment box or like having a really easy way at the bottom of your programs every time, you know, no matter who you are, no matter what you're doing, Oregon Symphony, you know, New York Phil, the end, be like, this is the email address. If you have any feedback, we would love to hear your response. Right. And I, and then in my brain, I was like, well, yeah, but only when you're doing like risky concerts. And then I'm like, what do you mean? What are we talking about? Like every concert should feel like you have, I'm just in my own internal monologue, but right. Like if you're doing it, then everything should feel like it has a mission and that mission should always be receiving feedback from your community, right? So I think that's a really cool thing. Anyway, that's all. <laughs> I was just <laughs> ruminating on that a little bit. This has been so wonderful. I wanted to just be cognizant of our time and respectful of all of you. Uh, also, Dylan, it's so nice to see you. Yes, hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I to a question, but. <laughs> oh. Well, like, you guys were talking about everything I wanted to talk about. I, I also, well, this is like really quick. Sorry, Maddie. Um, <laughs> I was like thinking about how, like, because the title of this discussion is, is contemporary storytelling in classical music, and it just makes you think about the ways I wasn't. So the project that you've been working on, Sam, is you've commissioned a piece. Is that what's happening? And it's. Um, I was trying to figure out what exactly is, is it about actual like late American patriots. 
You were, you know what? I talked so much and I don't know that I explained that. So <laughs> I apologize. No, 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 no. Sorry to make this go on, but I was, I was curious. Yeah. yeah. Um, it go is. Ahead. I'm like, I'm on the right track. Uh, it's about, basically it's about, it, my goal was to get perspectives from these people on kind of the state of America. So basically the way it works, it's 18 songs, 16 come from the interviews too, or the setting of the new Colossus. And they're each parts of me interviewing people, asking them a series of questions. So some people are responding to the question of like, do you identify as a patriot? And they're like sing, and they're icing their responses. Other people are talking about what they think the American dream is and how they would define that if they had to. Other people are talking about the way their family grew up and the values that their family instilled in them. Other people are talking about whether America has a race problem, yes or no. Like, you know, spoiler, somebody doesn't think we have a race problem. Um, like, you know, and so they're, they're the questions that the people are answering, are, like I probably in the interviews asked, I don't remember, 14, 15 questions. And then of course there were follow-up things. And then the, basically the way American Patriots works is they're grouped based off of theme. So like, there's a set of songs that are talking about patriotism. There's a set of songs talking about education. There's a set of songs talking about American dream. And there's a set of songs talking about, um, just forgot one of the categories, uh, a family um, and like growing up in America. Um, and so that's kind of the way they're organized. Yeah, yeah, I see. That's, well, that's awesome. I am definitely gonna follow up and follow with this project. And I, I was gonna say, it was making me think about contemporary storytelling and classical music and how just different because it brought me back to this I on my half my junior recital in college for clarinet I was playing this contemporary piece that was written about the mythical creatures sirens and I was really wanting to like collaborate with like a visual artist or something to like create some kind of video mm -hmm. to display while I was playing and my professor was just not with it he was like absolutely not like and I could understand, he was like, you know, the composer wasn't really intending that, you know, you need to encapture it with your sound. And I'm like, okay, okay, I can still do that. And so it just makes you think about, I don't know, I don't even know where I was, was going with that, but it, it, it's just like, because sometimes even if you're a solo performer, it's like, I envision like being the performer, but in like an orchestral, like operatic pit orchestra kind of way, where it's like you hear the music, but there's something visually like different happening. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like, like the worlds that we have in our mind are so powerful in how we present. And so if we can like create yeah. different worlds, then like the way we present the music will be different. Right. Is that, is that key? Yeah. Okay. And I, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and like having the flexibility to like innovate and create and be, you know, be contemporary and set it in a new way in a in a way that is respectful and cognizant of the intention, but also sort of like I see you and I raise you a video of mermaids, right? <laughs> like, how do we how do we make that uh, how do we make that happen? Yeah. Nice. Yay. Well, thank you all so much. This has been wonderful, Sam. It's so nice to meet you and get to chat with you. I really appreciate your time. And Danielle and Dylan, Dylan nice to see you. And Abby, I see you all the time. So it's fun. <laughs> it was, I, yeah, Sam, I really enjoyed that. Justin is sending his applause too. We really enjoyed that. And I can't yeah. wait to see the video. Absolutely. I'll, I'll send you guys the link. It's, it's album. Right. I'll just send it to you. <laughs> And thank you all so, so much for having me. This was really awesome. Um, Danielle, it's always a pleasure and I need to, we need to schedule time to, to Zoom. Oh, always a pleasure, so great. <laughs> all right, y'all have a great evening. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.